Welcome, dear readers, to Cover My Ass, where baffling books are reviewed but not read by yours truly. My name is Kaki. And I'm Kay. And remember, we only judge a book by its cover. Hey, Kaki. Kaki. Yes, Kaki. Yes. Oh, it's no, you. No, I'm, hey, I'm right Kaki. here. I yes. found you. Excellent. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. There you are. Yeah, I, we're, we're running way behind. There's like been several episodes that we need to recording. We've missed like recording well, for I'm, the last two weeks. No, we missed recording the, the two weeks previous. We've been huh? we've been recording two weeks. No, I haven't seen you the last two weeks. Wait, no, hold on. By the way, you've, you've gained some weight. What? Yeah, and, and where's your fetching trench coat? I never wear a trench coat. Is this going to be one of those weird things that we just sort of accept? Well, like some, no, no, the there's, some, there's been some weird shit going on. So I think I know right. why you're talking about trench coats now, because I found something out. Oh, okay. Someone's been impersonating you. Actually, Me? Yes, three some. Well, yes, Tristan. They're called Stan, Stan, and Stan, so I call them Tristan. I found and that, that. Okay, yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm yeah. with you. They were impersonating you, and we've been doing recordings with them, and it's been, it's a bit weird. Okay, and they were rac- raccoons. They were raccoons. In yeah. Fact. See, uh, I had sort of an inkling. What? Apparently, I've been recording with with Tristan. I really wonder if those are their names. Like, how did how did you, did the names ever come up? I wonder. I mean, they never told me their names. They said well, they were K. Uh, okay, well, no, yes, that's... but I found out that they weren't you. They said they were cocky as well, and I found out that oh. they weren't. Oh, look I, at I, you! I, dis- I, I pulled their hat off, shook them out of the trench coat. Oh, wow! And it turns out three raccoons. Wow! Oh, I wish there was a recording of that. That sounds like a very dramatic thing. <laughs> so, oh, I'm I'm kind of envious now because I never. I mean, I I think I recorded three episodes. Yeah, looking back on it. Oh. Two or three episodes. Maybe this is the third. Who's to say? Hmm. Uh, it all sort of blends together. It's weird. I mean, okay, so I, I figured out something about the library. Whoa. Remember the gnomes? Y- yes. They yes, weren't we gnomes. They were raccoons. They were raccoons they've this been, whole time. They've been raccoons the entire time, and they thought, oh, yeah. decided to make a break for it. And they, I guess they wanted a little bit in on the action that we've been getting up to and uh, have been kind of like ins- uh, insinuating. Okay, that, that really like ties a lot together. I'm realizing now that there was a lot of clues in here. Hey, for the readers at home, uh, I hope that you've that you've enjoyed piecing together the great mystery of the raccoons. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I believe, I do believe they in fact left, left clues behind. There's one clue though. Hey, there's one clue that's, yeah. that's still sticking in my craw that I couldn't quite figure out. What's that? Okay, I just now realized that you probably weren't party to it because you were raccoons at the time, but there was something about being in the Bangsian literature section of the, of the library. Uh-huh. And they said that it would come up. And it didn't. Ah, uh, well, Bangsians are Bangsian, yeah. as in uh, a different historical figure meet, meeting in the oh, afterlife. I, I do remember say, something something about that. Really? Uh, uh, How? You weren't there, were you? No, no, you I were mean, I, That's what I mean. I, oh yes, of course. Yes, that's I do right. have a section of that. Uh, Stephen Neil Stevenson does that very well, actually. Really? Yes. Uh, his books uh, I've read. Cryptonomicon? No, I haven't read it yet. Ah, uh, okay. So that's one of the, uh, the ones, and he's got his other the, the the historical fiction cycle that he does as well. Is that the Baroque cycle? Yes, that's the one. Oh no, we're doing a literary review <laughs> podcast. No, we must. <laughs> do this. We mustn't do this. Our readers have certain expectations. Okay, so, Kay, I'm so happy to, I mean, I, I kind of feel redundant because I've been through this this experience before. Like, I missed you for three whole weeks. Oh, but look at us sleuthing this out because they, they just uh, completely got... You're, ba- go- you're already getting one in early for the uh, uh, Segway Award of 2020, yeah, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That actually brings us to this week's book. Oh, yeah. What do we have in store for our readers uh, this, this week? This week's book is by Max Elrich, The Big Eye, a fantastic novel of the future. Thank you for the suggestion, by the way. This week's book was suggested to us by uh, Glimmerstomp on uh, on Twitter, a, a friend of the library who... Words fall short, let's just say. All right. It sounds yeah. like... Uh, yeah. I mean, well, thank you very much he's for a, suggest- he's a very making good the suggestion. Person. Yeah. Let's go to the synopsis of the book. It's like, you've enjoyed the noir classics, The Big Heat and The Big Sleep, and now we're going to try The Big Eye. My partner, Denton Wrinkle Suit, just ain't cut out to be a private eye, always tripping on sidewalks, taking his dates and their perky nipples down with him. Well, buddy... Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Come on, it's a, it's a noir thing. You've got uh, to, you've uh, got to uh, sort of growl right. it. People right. want the sexy growl. Right. Well, buddy, try doing a stakeout as a very public eye like me. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Let, me, let, me, let, me, let me try. Uh. Uh. <coughs> well, buddy, try doing a stakeout. No, that's way too bad, isn't it? Okay. Uh, it's like well, it's- buddy, try doing... <sighs> that's going, you're going to no, New York now. Yeah, okay. Well, buddy... Try doing a stakeout of a very public eye. Well, like boy, me. howdy. Try doing a stakeout of a very public eye. <laughs> no, no, uh, oh, but, but, no, no. This is like DNA <laughs> thing. We're not going to. Mr. DNA. I, I, know oh. how, I, I know what bookworm diet does to you. We're not having that again. <laughs> oh, I love your callbacks, Kay. I've missed them so much. So, yes. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Okay, well, buddy. please continue. <laughs> I'm going to continue or you're going to continue? No, please, please. Right. I'll, I'll be quiet. Well, buddy, try doing a stakeout of a very public eye like me. It's going real great. I'm sure nobody's noticed me up here. Just like I didn't notice that goddamn skyscraper that sucked me right in the cornea. 
These people, maybe if I had a jaunty bow tie, they'd find me less frightening, and the warning I'd boomed out was about an eye dilation since I'd just been to the dock. Not sure where they got the annihilation red peril they call me. Well, maybe I do need some drops, and I sure do need a drink. Okay, so let's talk about the cover because yep. there's a lot. There is a lot. Going I mean, on. there's a lot going on there, but there is there is just a lot. So, Starting yes. off at the top left. Top left. Uh, what's on? What does it it on? says popular library. Yes, which uh, I found very compelling because that suggests the existence of an unpopular, unpopular. library. <laughs> <laughs> and I know good. it's not the topic of today's book, but I'm very curious about the, the, unpopular, about the unpopular library. library yes, a it's, fantastic novel of the future. It's very much a like you know four color paperback. Do they have four color? paperbacks i suppose they do um, yeah red peril rode the heavens as a frightened world faced annihilation we see the, the titular red eye of course who is like uh, hovering above the gray yep. cityscape a giant red moon with a with a yeah. with a huge eye on it the I'm title not, says the big eye it says the, eye but you know if you told me that it was either a nipple or a navel i would have also bought it yeah me too but although me I too. guess they don't have an eyebrow, but which I can kind of see. But or like, eyelids. Oh, that upper curve is like the eyelid, I suppose. And then they've got that little, little squiggly bit in the corner of the eye. So I guess it's a right eye. Uh, just a squiggly. Yes, yes. Yes, that's right. But again, the cornea looks a bit like a crater. I mean, maybe that's the skyscraper's fault. The pupil. The pupil. Sorry, that's what. Yeah, it looks like yeah, an impact yeah. cra- a lunar impact crater or it something. It does. It does. And the iris sort of blends into the sclera. Yes. What are the parts of the eye? The sclera is the white bit. Is the white bit? Well, it's it's white with us, but mm. I, I think horses have black sclera. Do they? Yeah. No. Oh. No. No. Horses have white. Of, uh, have white as well. When oh, they roll no, their no, eyes, I mean, you can see not them. all. Ah. Not all horses. I have thought white they just sclera. had like huge irises, which which kind of like. Also, mm. well, I, I think most animals have irises that cover most of their yeah. exposed mean, eye. I'm able- saying that out loud now. Is that the case? No, I think so too. Because like the fact that it's in humans and monkeys, like having the sh- the white sh- uh, showing permanently, it allows other members of your species to see where see you're what looking. you're looking at. Yes. yes, and that's a very important social thing. Yes, because. Because you can't see what we're listening at, because our ears don't move. I suppose not, no. But which, you know, which for a, a, a dog or a cat is a much more important indicator of their I guess, yeah, you can see the eyes swiveling in. around. But it make, make, makes for an interesting thing. I, I think they, they did a little study with horses, yeah. where, they, where they can actually, horses know how to point. Uh, oh, not just know how to point. Yeah. I know that when you're talking about, not just know how to point, they can figure out yeah. new ways to, to point. Then they're like, oi, you've got that, that apple over there. It's like you yes. have access to that or the gate oh, or whatever it's called. It's, like- it's, it's, it's hetero something indicate. So yes, the challenge is a horse wants something. Yeah. Can it figure out a new way to make a handler understand what it wants? Okay. I didn't get that part. Uh-huh. Yeah. So like there are three buckets outside of the, outside of the stall. Mm-hmm. They will have food in them, but one of them has a, has a treat that the horse particularly. The desirable, desirable food. Yes. Yeah. Now the subject horse has to figure out how to get the handler's attention and make them pick that bucket that they yeah, want. Yeah. How do I communicate which bucket I want? Yeah, yeah. Right. And so they tried this with, uh, with, with, with different horses and different setups and also with like the handlers obviously in on it. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, where the handler Plain was. dumb, I guess. And then the horse tries out. I mean, obviously wonks and, and throws a stink and tries to, <laughs> tries to get attention. And yeah. then now I've got your attention. Now I'm going to be very good. I'm going to stare and stare and stare at the bucket that I want. And if you touch the wrong one, I'm going to wonk again. Ah, and they just try yeah. different things. To see what, because if that what, doesn't work, we'll try something else. Yeah. And I think that the one I heard was about like it's, it's something similar, but like the horse wanting to go somewhere and like trying to indicate to the handler that they wanted the gate opened. Oh yeah, uh, uh, some, something like that. Because like yeah, again, that was a treat on the other side that the horse wanted, or something like nudging and going like pointing with their muzzle, or this, with going this. with the, doing the eye thing. That go really? There. Yeah. Oh, that must have been. That yeah, must yeah. have looked so weird. <laughs> I think dogs also understand pointing. Cats don't. They're like well, well hmm. I mean, they do have poor vi- close-up vision. So, like, if you yeah, point at something it, on the ground, then like, they, how, how many cat-like things have scientists discovered that? Oh no, they do understand. They just don't care. They just yeah, don't, no, that's yeah, a good point. They can understand their name. They can understand basic instructions. They, they can understand all of that. They just don't bother. Yeah, uh, they can also understand. I mean, for a long time, it was thought that uh, cats can't pass the mirror test. Ah, yes. Right, okay, so they don't yeah. recognize that, that that which is in the mirror is actually yeah. themselves. Yeah, they actually can. Oh, they, they just don't care. We're work. staying very on topic in all of our almost, tangential almost derivations ent- almost here. Almost entirely not. <laughs> so we see the, the scene described in the prompt where Denton Wrinkled Shirt is uh, tripping with his date as they're ah, running yes, away from yes. the… Uh, Titany love boobs. Oh, yes. From the um, Laura Croft School of Dressing, I see. H- how do you mean that? I mean, I mean the old original low poly count Lara Croft. Oh, yes. I do see what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Boy, isn't she perky? I guess it must be cold out there. In the, uh, 
<laughs> it does look cold. It, do, it looks does look like a, well, it, a, a it, cold it, and stormy night. It looks a bit grayscale, or no, no, uh, we'll, with the exception we'll, of the one building on the right. You see true, that? True, but we'll, one we'll, sliver of yeah, a building. We'll get, we'll get to that in a yes, little of bit. Course. The big eye in the sky, from which they seem to be running. Yes, yeah. uh, Alan Pearson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I liked that that pun because it was it was uh, two e's because it's uh, yeah Alan Pearson staring at them from above, and then also strangely there is a an overlay of a of a worried looking man in a bow tie yes a, a receding look a hairline I mean he sort of looks like a librarianish gentleman yeah. which is weird because what well, do we look like well, eh? uh, well yes I think that's a, a, a Salvatore Deli. Who is, uh, <laughs> yes. who is the uh, virtualization transcoder, but we'll get to that in a little bit later. Yeah, because this is, hey, this is a fantastic novel from the future, future yes. of the future. I'm so excited, Kay. I I love detective stories, and I especially love these these old hard-boiled detective stories, because there's always, like, two intertwined cases. Plots, yes. Yeah, that, that seem unrelated, but then they actually turn out to be the, the, the same case, and there's, mm. oh, there's a whole host of interesting characters, and ultimately, a very smart resolution that... You can tell they planned from the start, whoever the writer was. Absolutely. That's it's the like, part that yeah, I'm that's like, they're, they're very like, excited to get to. The, yeah, basically working back from a clever idea and constructing a plot around it. And then like, instead, we as the reader just get to experience it as if it's, as if it's all just naturally well, unfolding and yes. it amazingly comes and together. That's, that's good writing. I mean, a lot of writers, especially in this genre, use kind of like murder boards to keep their plots uh, together. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm tacking evidence and, exactly. and, and drawing yeah. lines between them. Yeah. And you just, yeah, yeah. And like oh, should we do that? Should we? Hey, I've still got a stack of unburnt index cards. Yes. Shall we? Shall we make our own little murder board? Oh, sounds like a great idea. Let's yeah, do that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Do, yeah. We can put some glue strips on the index cards, and then we can stick yeah. them to the board. Oh, this will be fun. All right. So our story opens obviously with the monologue from Alan Pearson, who, yes. like, I love that this is a world where everybody just sort of accepts that Alan Pearson is a giant red eye in the in the sky. I mean, initially yeah. he is just a citizen of this unnamed city uh, until he. Becomes Comes a private eye, and thereby quite a quite a public eye, and that's when the press start reporting about him as the as the as the what is it the red peril? Yes. No, what was it? The red peril. Yes. yes, the eye in the sky. Like who is who watches the watcher? Well, he does do a lot of watching. It's like he's peering into windows, and like you like you can see like oh yeah. that's an interesting red sunset, and they're like no, there's this big eye hovering in front of your <laughs> yeah. apartment window and looking inside and just staring and staring. And, and uh, yeah, there's, suddenly there's a bit of a premium on houses which have like rooms which are completely sealed off from the outside. Also, curtains are booming. Uh, Especially French well, blinds. Venetian blinds. Ven- Venetian blinds. That's, that's the one. This is noir, French, after all. Why did I think French blinds? Well, they're but, vertical, aren't they? Well, that's the difference between Venetian and French blinds. That's what I thought. Venetian oh. or horizontal. Okay. I and then no you idea. get the horizontal uh, slitty lighting for the, yes. uh, for the, for the which, film which noir. Takes, which takes an incredible amount of setting up to do. Really? Uh, you, need, you need parallel light. If, if you have a point light source, then the whole slat thing doesn't really work very well. Oh, uh, they had Fresnel lenses for that. That makes sense. And that parallelizes the light. Yeah, and then fine. you draw slats on the Fresnel. I was going to say, doing it with actual slats kind of like... Yeah, nah, it's you, pointless. You need sudden light because you need like yeah, light actually coming in parallel from a large enough surface. So, that. yes, yeah. because of the uh, premium on privacy, uh, uh, we enter an era where the most powerful person in the city is the one-eyed Venetian. Mm. Because in the land of Venetian blinds... Yeah. The one-eyed Venetian, Venetian is king. king. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was very clever of uh, Mr. So. Uh, Mr. Early. Yeah, I thought it was very clever. I, I thought it was very... <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, Alan Pearson, who is working for the Pink Kaitons agency. <laughs> You're right there. <laughs> Kaki. God, it's going to be one of those ones, isn't it? Well, hold on. Wasn't the Pink Kaitons agency uh, where he used to work for? Because it is often a trope that the uh, grizzled detective is like an embittered war veteran, mm-hmm. right? That is that he's that he's quit some prior service, like a like a like a U.S. Ranger or a Marshal or a Pinkerton in yeah. in this case, who is retired from that. Like, do you think that could be the illusion here? I must have missed that. It makes, well, it, it is makes sense. Of, it is dense with clues. Isn't it, it is. It's very much and that like so. Yes, he's looking for a missing person. So. Ah, yeah, because this is the first of our our two seemingly unrelated cases. Mm. Yes, he's looking for uh, Elric Wolfson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in this particularly grayscale world where only the people seem to have color. Yeah, isn't that bizarre? Uh, mo- most everything seems to have a more of a gray background type color. Yeah. Un- un- unless, of course, it's an important building, because that's I think that's what we're seeing on the front cover. That like 
everything is kind of like grayscale, and unless it is the object of the story, in which case it is colored. Everything's fairly. I mean, people are still fairly monochrome. Like my dude, I was I was most invested in uh, Denton Wrinkle Suits' yeah. uh, uh, a plot. Like he's mm-hmm. mostly like various shades of red, uh, well, as far as it gets color. Whereas I would say it's more brownish. But yeah, I see where you, where the red's coming from. Oh, well, that's fair enough. I mean, I guess you mix I mean, in a little bit of yellow. I mean, it's like one of those typical, you know, brown suits like that were so popular. I guess in the thirties, weren't brown suits popular? I mean, we didn't have m- much. Yeah, color I don't. Vision back then. The extremely boxy, broad shoulder suit that, right. that tapered down to the ankles. I also, also, also just noticed the uh, Dilbert tie that a uh, wrinkle suit is wearing. He's also- oh, oh, yes! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the top strip of his tie is flipped up over his shoulder and kind of kind uh, of hovering and there. The, and the other part is uh, tucked into his shirt, which I do believe is a bit of a, uh, a fashion sin. It kind of screams like, I mistied my tie, and it's or like it the, t- and the tail, is, t- yeah. t- the tail yeah. is sticking out over the front end, and therefore I need to like um, tuck it away to, to hide my fashion crimes. Hide my shame. Because otherwise he's a very well put together. I mean, aside from the fact that his suit is perennially wrinkly. And he's a bit fresh-faced. He's a cutie, isn't he? He is. He's, he's got the little apple like cheeks. Like, he looks like he's 18 or oh something. Oh, boy, gosh. Yeah. So, I mean, he's a he's a bit of a greenhorn, and yet now he's uh, he's tasked, this was the case that I thought was, uh, yeah. was most interesting, with a uh, multiple homicide, but like a rather bizarre one where essentially the same murder takes place over and over again. Mm. I mean, I guess you could call it a serial killer who is like has a very clear modus operandi, I believe it's called. Uh, yeah. Where they're like, oh, this has all the signs of the stalk eye stabber or whatever they tend to uh, call like a... <laughs> yeah. I mean, stalk people and stuff. Are, there's a lot of people with weird character traits. I mean, just like, you know, Alan Pearson. Yes. I mean, he's not very unusual in the unnamed city of the of the Eternal Night. Mm. I mean, some people are indeed black and white, and you can sort of tell that they are unimportant characters who are just filler. Because, like, there was one character that was sort of like that. That was Alan Pearson's secretary, Dot, mm-hmm. who... Is she, like, literally a spot of light that flashes on and off to indicate whether she's... I think so, yes. Because it's always alluded to, and Dot indicated yes. Yeah, I think it's like one, like, you know, in, in Legend of Zelda, like, the the little binary... The like, floating the bite? Fairy, yes. You're thinking of Tron? No, also. Yes, 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 yes. No, no, yes, yeah, exactly like that. <laughs> but, like, you know, the little fairy thing in, in Legend of Zelda, which sometimes... Hey! Uh, oh, uh, whatever yes. Whatever it's called. Uh, hey, yeah. hey, hey, over here! Exactly, hey. that one. Hey! It's kind of like Dot. Dumb shit! <laughs> Fuck you. like you've been paying you've not been paying attention to this <laughs> uh, um, so the multiple homicide is uh, assigned to Denton wrinkle suit yep. let me see how did, how did the book go I'm just thinking again how did, how the book went yes yes Denton wrinkle suit is dating Titney love boobs whose dad is the one-eyed Venetian and it's he who assigns the multiple homicide case because right. All of the victims of these nearly identical murders have the same thing in common. They're all from Venice, and they all have one eye. And every night, another one of them is being murdered, and he knows that eventually, I'm They're, going to be next. Yes. One-eyed people from Venice, I mean, you're going to run out probably sooner rather than later. I mean, there are quite a few in the in the unnamed city. Now, of course, there can be only one one-eyed Venetian, so they all had to have... Like, they all had to go for different nicknames. Mm. None of them can have a nickname related to only having one eye. Or at least Vene being Venetian. Yes. Right, because, I mean, certainly the one-eyed Venetian wouldn't wouldn't stand for it. I mean, there's the one-eyed not Florentine, and he's kind of like trying to get away with it. But he's like, it <laughs> doesn't last very long, and he's the no, next one on the list. Exactly. So the the, the first one that uh, uh, Denton Wrinklesuit goes to investigate uh, uh, is Freddy the Freedom. Mm-hmm. I kind of liked how how all of them were. What's a freedom again? Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, okay, that it all comes together in the end. It all comes together. Yes. Uh, who is who is regrettably already deceased by the time that Denton comes to talk to him, uh, murdered in the exact same strangely bloodless fashion mm-hmm. as as all the other victims, just lying there completely inert, just gazing up at the sky with their their one good eye. Uh, so he immediately rushes to the next one that he goes to is uh, Guido the Guiche. <laughs> this. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. The, these are all gangsters, you know. They're yeah. they're they're known for the most obvious, prominent thing th- about them. I think it's a bit gauche, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, who who says that he's fleeing town mm-hmm. uh, because he doesn't want the one-eyed Venetian murderer to come and get oh, him? She's so only just got the one. No, no, no. Yes. Um, <laughs> next on the list is Larry the Ladder. Yeah. Now, Larry the Ladder, he's a tough guy, so he's he surrounded himself with uh, with guards, and he thinks that yeah. he's not going to be got by the one-eyed yes. killer. It's a bit bumpy 
happy, but you know, it's <laughs> inf- unfortunately he too gets uh, caught in, and it's Mr. Wrinkle Suit. He's always a little bit behind. Uh, uh, certainly, Gita the Quiche. He couldn't find Dano the Dido. No, I, I honestly don't know what the what the deal was with that one. But the last person that he finds, together with Titney Love Boobs, whom, uh-huh. whom he 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 pins all of his hope on, is Prince Albert, yeah. the he, lounge jazz singer. Yeah, he's also the one-eyed Venetian's heir. <laughs> Yes, that's right. <laughs> Heavy hangs the head that wears the ring. What? Heads don't wear ring. Oh, yes. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh. So, uh, honestly, Denton, Denton Wrinkle Suits' part of the story was mostly like a good old-fashioned, like chasing up leads and, and pursuing various perps and a, and a couple of blind alleys. Hey. Yeah, uh, yes, the dead ends, uh, most likely. Yeah. It, it, it involved quite a lot of breaching through narrow passages. and uh, Yeah, yeah. A lot of penetrating question and yeah. piercing gazes. That's one. Gauging <laughs> lot, lot responses. Of, lot of anticipation. And finally putting the guilty behind bars. Yeah, the, there was some uh, premature ejections from... From the, yeah. <laughs> we all have a, a quick run through all of their various characteristics. Uh, yeah, but main, mainly described in uh, Wrinkle Suits, uh, describing the aftermath of the scene that he finds and yeah. uh, piecing together what must have occurred at the various crime scenes. And this, I think, is honestly how Denton Wrinkle Suits, despite being such a greenhorn, earns his spurs as a private investigator. As much privates have been investigated here. <laughs> Now, no, no. What about the other story? Because I was also really interested in in Alan Pearson's story. Well, how did that? How did that go? There's, there, he's basically lo- using his peering powers to uh, look through different windows, uh, trying to find the uh, the missing Elric. And it turns out that this uh, Salvatore Deli on the front cover mm-hmm. is uh, the prime suspect in the missing case. Ah, yeah. And this is where we start to learn a little bit more about what what is actually going on in this world. Yes, which was also the reason why everything is uh, in grayscale. It's basically a backdrop for a virtual world in yes. which this is all taking place. The the, the, the virtual world of uh, Virtualosa, which has Ooh, been yeah. which has been created by Elric Wolfson. Uh, one of my favorite noir stories is the film The Thirteenth Floor. Mm-hmm. It came out in the same year as as The Matrix and was sort of derivative, yeah. like oh everything's a simulation. But it's 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 wonderfderfully performed. It's wonderful, like layers of existential dread, which is also something that you're supposed to have yeah. in uh, in noir. So I really like. I can imagine that some people may have been dismayed, like oh it's a virtual world, oh it's all a dream. No, I absolutely love this kind of this kind of trope. Because, yeah, at least on the Denton side, they don't know. No, they don't. Everybody there thinks that they're uh, real. And they, they kind of are real because they, they've been, like, uh, virtually encoded. And that's why Alan Pearson is, like, a big eye in the sky. Uh, so it yeah. turns out something went kind of wrong when he was, like, being transcoded. And, you know, Mr. Salvador Deli probably had a hand in this. Uh, yeah, like, his entire face got, got smeared across the across the world. Uh, Although that did give him a key advantage that not a lot of people knew about. The walls have his ears. No. So while he can't see into every room, he can certainly he hear. listen into it and like, yeah, it takes him a long time to like work out how he can be- best make use of that and not get deafened by the, the cacophony of uh, everything happen at the same time. And that's his biggest problem that he needs to deal with. That's why he focuses on looking so much in the beginning. Well, he's yeah, kind of like he's getting a, his, his ears a are getting private drowned eye in the out. Public eye. Yeah. Only hey, later. Hey. He, yeah. <laughs> What's the difference between a detective and a pirate? Uh, what is the difference between a detective and a pirate? One's a private eye and the other's a privateer. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. Great, and he's great, also great for, jokes. And, and, like, aren't pirates also, like, one-eyed tradition? Or I guess it's a bit of a pirate trope. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, one-eyed Willy. Oh, yeah. hey. uh, yes. <laughs> uh, wasn't he one of the characters in... Uh, like, really? No. Are we, were you going to say some kind of children's program? Because well, I don't imagine that they would have had a one-eyed Willy on a no, children's I'll, program. I'll, but I'll, that doesn't I'll, seem right I was going to say Pirates of the Caribbean. But that's, like, the one-eyed guy with the wooden eye in, uh, in there, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh. That still looks around and it has... Fork in it. Oh, yeah, at gosh. one point, yes. And what a oh, good we'll film get, that we'll get was. you a new eye that doesn't splinter. And it's oh, just like, like, <laughs> he's so he's so happy at the prospect of a, a non-splintering of eye. Non-splinter. That's like, oh, that sounds. <laughs> oh God, that sounds horrible. Hey, how how does that work when when one doesn't have an eye yeah. uh, anymore? Like I one wears it. Yeah. Well, one can one can have a a, a fake eye, yeah. right? A, a glass eye. I don't know if glass is the is the preferred material. Yeah. But one pops that in. Yeah. But what's on the inside of the socket? Like, does that get a coating, or does like I have no skin idea. grow there? I have no idea. Like yeah. Peter Falk, the actor, famously had a had a glass eye. Yeah. Uh, uh, Columbo. I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's. it's I, I mean, it can't just be the 
bone, the bone socket. No, no, I assume. The, I mean, your, your, the, your no, brain. of course, no, no. Your eyeball has a. I, I guess it's kind of like a mucus pocket, like your nose. I assume the eye is something like that, the eye socket. But your eye is attached by muscles. Oh, I suppose yeah. To the uh, at least to the side, so on yeah. the inside. Yeah, you can have an eyeball dangling on the optical nerve, I suppose, when things go catastrophically. Yeah, I mean, your eye can... yeah. Okay, so I'm a person who's had an eye operation uh, yeah. to, to have the, the, the muscles yes. uh, uh, reattached after they had to be moved because I was, I was born quite cross-eyed. And my mother, bless her heart, she told me that they were going to put me under in the in the hospital. Yeah. I, was a, I was a wee bairn at the time. And they're going to take a spoon and they're going to pop my eye out yeah. and fix it then pop it back in. <laughs> yes. And I was like deep into my teens, yeah, still believing that, that before. That's actually and, true. Okay. Yeah, until I saw biology. Was, no, they're they're well attached on there. Like I okay. think that all has to be. And and I don't know how long the nerve is, but I believe that the oh, not to gross anybody out, but I do believe that the nerve goes from the back of the eye through a hole in the eye socket. Yeah. There's a hole in there. It seems to me right. Right onto the brain. Mm-hmm. See, that's why we have our brains in our heads, which is not a very safe way to put the, right. such an important. I mean, it's a good place to cool it. You probably don't want it There's next that. to your heart. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you've got to have your brain close to your eyes because oh. it takes a lot of processing yeah. power I mean, and evolutionarily. Years, yeah. Two years as well, I suppose. But, you know, like it helps. Oh, that's to probably have, true. Yeah. Huh. And you want your eyes close to your mouth and then you want your mouth to be mobile. So it makes sense to have your brain in your head. Why do you want your eyes need to be close to your mouth? So you e- can easily shoveling food into it? Yeah. That seems I mean, sense. most everything has a... I mean, a lot of, lot of creatures can't see their, their mouth. Yeah, but I can't see my mouth. Okay, yeah. Maybe just your lip, yeah. Like, okay, dear readers, we are both sitting here making very <laughs> yeah. funny faces at the moment. Right? Like, Maybe we should see, see if we can pass yeah. the, uh, the mirror test. Speaking of passing the test, yeah, yeah. how does... Uh, uh, I was very curious how Alan Pearson solves this uh, conundrum. What, what we learn is that Elric Wolfson has gone missing in his own virtual world, and Salvador Deli has made off with the lost master key. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's, he, he's causing new entries into the world to be oddly uh, designed, like, you know, like eyes scraped across the side, yes. drooping noses, people have melted on the sidewalks. Uh, uh, memories kind of missing. Like memories missing and all kind of things like that. And the reason for this turns out that yes. uh, they have uh, found a way to encode a deceased brain and make it continue into to live in yeah. the uh, in the virtualosa world isn't that oh isn't that on the one hand the dream and also the nightmare it, is, is this afterlife i mean is it even real and it turns kind into of, yeah. it is kind of but it's like you know it's like you know, it's all thing is the cop is a copy is an exact copy of the thing the same as the thing oh uh, oh yeah there are some pieces of fiction that, that deal with that i saw oh my god i'm gonna to have to credit this there was a tweet about how um okay so everybody's up in arms about the star trek teleporter yeah and how it essentially like creates a new copy of you and destroys oh, the Yes. one, but this is exactly how elevators work, and everybody's okay with that. No. <laughs> Wait, this is like Wait. it doesn't remind me of that cartoon with like this dog standing there and in the elevator. And I was like, yeah, it's weird. Those doors close and they rebuild the entire world outside it, and when they open again, it's different. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I do believe that I've seen. I think I've seen that in in, in cinema happening. Where you know people step into oh yes yeah they step the, into the, the an elevator famous continuous shot where they have exactly like, they have this like ten second shot in the elevator which is those people standing around and looking at each other while in the, in the meantime outside everybody's rebuilding the entire rebuilding the whole set and, and this happens several times there's a this, I think it's a Hong Kong movie where they, they do this several times oh uh, wow yeah and it's it's like a, a minutes long shot and it's all it, all all done in one shot where they're completely so rebuild, glorious rebuilding the outside <laughs> but yes so the connection between the cases turns out to be that all the the, the dead one-eyed Venetians are yeah, like yeah. Uh, the, the deceased brains which have been encoded in the real world and are yes. now being offed in the virtual world, which yep. I guess counts as a double murder or something like that. Kind of. I mean, yeah. it's a it's a confirmatory homicide, I suppose. It's like, yeah, we're making, and yeah, Mr. Uh, Deli, who made off with the codes, he didn't, really doesn't approve of this this whole real life thing. And yeah, he is trying to, to prevent right this. what he thinks went, uh, went wrong. Uh, went and like wrong. there's like these the, these Phoenicians, they died so they should remain dead and not even exist in the virtual world. And it takes Alan Pearson to find uh, Elric Wolfson. And who does Wolfson turn out to be? The one-eyed Venetian, Venetian, of course. Yes, it's like in the, he's always been there all along. These cases are obviously all entwined. This is why he was uh, he was worried. Eric Wolfson, the original one of the original designers himself, apparently has has died in the real world. And following in the footsteps of all these other uh, people whose deceased brains he and Salvador Deli transcribed, he secretly transcribed himself as well into into this world and hid behind the uh, Venetian blind empire. And in the final confrontation, he has to confront that he doesn't have any any legal standing in the real world. 
Where, yeah, and, and he has, certainly he has no moral authority over Salvador Deli. No. But what he does have is a daughter. Tiffany Lovebooth. Is a, is, is a fully fleshed out, wow. Yes, very uh, much so, very much so. <laughs> character, uh, uh, beloved by Denton Wrinklesuit, who even when he, when he remembers that he's just a player in Virtuoso. Um, Playing the role of a detective. Who kind of lost that. Part of his memory, like he's probably in the transcoding, s- yeah, sitting somewhere in a in a in a basement, like drooling into a VR helmet Myth. while he's emaciated by now. Well, I liked that the resolution wasn't like a gunfight. Oh, yes. that it was a that no. it was a conversation and a and a and coming they, to understand, yeah, working out how things are, and like yeah, I mean, Delhi gets cornered, he gets caught, and he's he's prevented from from killing the one eyed Venetian. And the one eyed Venetian has a proposal mm-hmm. to, as they've done many many times before, rewrite the rules that the dead can have a place in Virtuoso if they so choose, but they'll be black and white. Yeah, it's... Uh, and so that you can always tell who's alive and who's and who's dead, who's just a player and who and who wants to be a, 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 a figure. A ghost, I uh, guess. Yeah. No, well, not really. I mean, as far as they're concerned, Virtuoso is real. Thus, they can, they can embrace this illusion if they so choose, and having that cognitive clarity will also prevent future transcription errors so mm. the players can come in and play their game. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, especially uh, and just, when, when Delhi is, uh, like, basically getting a slap on the wrist for, like, messing things up, uh, which was clearly a ploy to stop uh, Alan Pearson from uh, following him too closely. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he tried to block it, which made for quite interesting uh, I thought so yeah, too. Uh, it, because in the meantime, Alan Pearson was also like piecing together his memories from the real world, where he was in fact an investigator. Yeah, yeah. Un- oh. un- unlike un- uh, unlike uh, wrinkle sir- uh, sh- uh, shirts, wrinkle, wrinkle, wrinkle suit. Who, yeah, suit, who's yeah. just some some person. Some we player. don't even know. Like, yeah. It could be some some high school chick uh, oh, yes. playing a hard boiled dude. We 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 just don't know. I thought it was a very magnanimous act for uh, Salvador Deli to agree that Titney Love boobs. Got to be in color, yeah. Even though she's a fully created virtual creature, she was she was born in this in Virtuosa, but she's her own person, and she absolutely counts. A good wrap up of the entire story. A final drawing of a redrawing of the map, as one might say, about this virtual world where the rules were 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 reset. Uh, uh, an act known as the vasectomy. Yes, where <laughs> before yeah. and after, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. I thought it was a very good book. Things became a little, I won't say they became impotent, but they did become a very much. Um, <laughs> I thought it was very potent. Oh, book. very, no, totally. I well, it was extremely stimulating. But, 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 but not so fertile, fertile anymore for any future development. <laughs> No. And, and as as with so many of these mystery stories, we have to reflect on it a little bit. We need a reflectory period after, oh, yes, uh, well, after the climax. Absolutely. So <laughs> how are we going to rate this book? Well, um, out of 30? 30? Well, um, how did you land on 30? It's a 30s thing. Yeah. The, the, All right. the film yeah. noir thing. It's like, you know, rated out of color or not color. That's going to be, get become really weird again. Okay, let's do it. That's actually good. No, hold on. Hold on. Look at the cover. It's a right. four-color cover. It is. Yeah. Oh, it is. Okay, so. So is, we have black, red, green, yellow, yellow, and green. Yeah. And then the brown is kind of like. And that's B-R-L-G. Brulg. Brulg. Okay. Out of four colors. Wow. We're. I'll give it green out of four colors. <laughs> four colors. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> yeah, so did I. I mean, as with so many of these stories, I was very skeptical throughout. Like, how is this going to come together? How how I is mean, the yeah. Max Ehrlich did a he did, did a, a, he did a, did a wonderful, wonderful bang up bang up job to get everything <laughs> very, everything to come together in the end. Very proud of him. Uh, and speaking of being proud, if you're if you're proud of us for doing this uh, plucky little podcast, please leave us a review on your service of choice. You can also find us on Cover My Ass Cast at Twitter dot com. Twitter dot com. How <laughs> formal. We are. Yeah. <laughs> cover my askcast at gmail.com is also our email address. If you've got maybe a suggestion for a cover, please let us know. Speaking of which, thanks again to Glimmer Stomp for suggesting the prompt for, for this week's book. Now, what do we have in store for our readers next week? Yes, next week's book is by BJ Novak. Stories and other stories. <laughs> Yes, that sounds great. And that about covers it. Thank you for joining us at Cover My Ass, where baffling books are reviewed, but not read. By yours truly, my name is Kaki. And I'm Kay. And remember, we only judge a book. We only judge a book. I forgot that we have going to do that together. It's been so long, Kay. Yes, yes. I've been doing it with raccoons. I had to to prompt the the whole time. Hey, hey, by the way, you made an adorable raccoon. I've got got to say. Turn into a bit of a (laughs) nuisance.